Hey guys, my name is Justin Woodring and this is Computing Science with Justin Woodring. Uh, today I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you about um, using .env in Rust. So obviously um, if you're not familiar with .env or Rust, uh, this video is uh, intended for that audience um, probably more than any other. Um, and so not really expecting any kind of, you know, coding ability in Rust, um, and if you've never heard of a .env, then you're in the perfect place. So, um, first we'll talk a little bit about what a .env is, and uh, really environment variables as well, um, and how they relate. So, environment variables, um, they, well, they're variables that uh, exist in the environment that your application runs in. Um, Typically, they include things like, you know, maybe the location of, um, you know, your home folder, um, possibly the location of other binaries that your application may need access to. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, if you install Rust on your system, it will likely get added to what they call the path. Um, and the path is an environment variable that exists during in your user session. Um, and uh, the path basically tells the shell, for example, if you're using PowerShell or Bash, where to actually look um, in order to even find uh, in order to even find the Rust binaries that you're trying to call. So for example, if you want to call Cargo, uh, Cargo doesn't get installed to a standard location um, like, you know, bin or something like that. It's going to get installed usually um, into your uh, user folder, your home directory. Um, so that's one case of a common path uh, or a common environment variable. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we'll talk briefly about the .env files and how they relate. And then finally, we'll just go implement this ourselves. So a .env file, uh, simply put, is just a file that contains environment variable definitions uh, that can be loaded from, well, a file. Usually this is used for development purposes. Um, in case, certain cases, um, especially in the past, uh, it was not uncommon to use .env files to contain configuration for an application. Um, this is kind of frowned upon these days because it's generally a bad security practice and there's plenty of articles and blogs and stuff you can read about this. Um, but for development purposes, .env files are still very useful uh, because generally speaking, when you're trying to you know, relaunch an application, you aren't going to want to have to um, you're not going to want to have to, uh, like, you know, basically redefine all these environment variables yourself at runtime before you start the application. You just want to run the application and then it loads the important stuff it needs from the .env. Um, in the case where someone was going to consider production deployment, typically these days a lot of applications get containerized. So um, you'll likely be bundling your application in a container, uh, like a Docker app or something like that, and then managing it with Kubernetes or something like that. Um, and in this case, um, the environment variables you need will be injected by Kubernetes um, as it, or yeah, basically by Kubernetes and Docker as they actually launch your application. So um, this is a really effective way to manage secrets um, because you don't you aren't storing this stuff in the env file. And really, the .env file, the main problem is obviously one is possible to dump API keys and stuff like that. Um, to some extent, that might always be an issue depending on how you configure your application. But the difference is that typically .env files get forgotten. Um, they, once they get set up, they're part of the infrastructure, and then no one ever looks at them ever again. Uh, in the case of something like Kubernetes, it's a lot more visible in the way that you manage your keys. So this is going to, um, it's generally, more, I guess, more like, uh, it's, it's just a better approach um, to designing these kinds of infrastructures. So like I said, without, again, without more further ado, let's actually go do this in Rust. Um, as I said, not really expecting any uh, Rust experience here. Um, you will need to install the Rust toolchain. You can get that from the Rust website. It's super straightforward. Um, it's like one command and you copy and paste it in your terminal and then you're basically done. Um, if you're on Windows, you might need to install Visual Studio first, but it also kind of tells you how to do that. So um, I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you can probably figure out how to install Rust yourself. Um, and yeah, let's get started. So. Um, I'm going to, 
create a new project and then I'm going to open said project. Um, who's that? So this is just beginner project. If you've watched any of my other videos, you probably saw something like this gets created. Um, it's just your main RS um, you know, with a hello world, just to kind of default stuff. So this is our cargo.toml where we're going to add dependencies. Um, we only need to add one dependency today, and that's going to be um, the uh, .env package. So you can just literally copy that string if you want. Um, and it's also possible to theoretically add it by just, uh, you know, I think you could type cargo install.env, um, or sorry, add.env, uh, cargo add.env in your terminal here, that will do it as well, as long as you're in the correct folder. Um, in this case, our package is called the nvtest, so you want to make sure you're in that folder. So um, we're going to go ahead and create a .env file, like so. And then we're going to also, um, we are going to use a couple imports here. So um, you can think of this, if, again, if you've never done imports before, um, at least in Rust, this is kind of like, you know, the equivalent of a, um, a using in C Sharp or maybe just like an actual uh, import in Java. Um, so, and then obviously an include in C would be another example. Um, so we're gonna use std colon env and we're also gonna use dot env in .env. So this is actually going to pull in a function named .env from .env. Um, and when we call this function, it's basically going to initialize some kind of object here and then call .ok. This is super simple. Basically, behind the scenes, this is actually doing a little bit for us. So this is basically going to open the .env file and then populate all the variables that are in .env into the environment itself so that they can be read uh, basically according to um, the way that or it basically initializes the variables that are defined into the file into the environment, assuming that they're not already defined in the environment. Now, this is a key point. Um, so we're going to keep going here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do if. So this is some uh, syntactic sugar for basically accessing um, something that's unsafe. So we don't necessarily know that the variable we're accessing is defined. But um, what we can do is we can say if it's defined, for example, if let OK here, um, we're basically destructuring a result. So we're going to go uh, env colon var, let's see, um, var, and then, let's see, something like that. And if Rust Analyzer was actually running right now, I don't know why it's failing down here, but if it was running, uh, we'd be getting a little bit more help from this uh, editor right now. So we can go ahead and do app. Uh, name so we'll say this is our environment variable we want to load um, and so we'll do sorry this is if let okay you like that so basically assuming that all this works blah blah, blah basically we ac can actually access this string um, then we're going to try to access it um, and so we can go ahead and basically uh, you know I guess Frankenstein our initial hello world statement right here into um, hello world from our app name. So, let's go ahead and just do that. And, you know, we'll see if we can actually run it. Um, there's a, a decent chance that I somehow missed something, so we'll see. So actually, no, it worked. Now, let's note, one, it didn't actually print anything out. And if we want to know why, it's because app name is not defined in our environment and it's not defined in the env file. So in other words, it couldn't even load app name. Now, if I had just tried to access this variable, it would have crashed and probably panicked or something like that um, and thrown an error. So it's important, again, to access things safely. And this is just an example of that. So if we go back to our env file, we could do this. We could say app name equals default. So that's our app name, assuming that we don't know what else to call it, and it's not supplied in the environment. So in development, we're, um, we're hello world from default app. Now, again, the beauty of something like .env here, again, not an optional package, you can still access environment variables without .env, but the beauty of .env is it's going to load those environment variables from this .env file. Um, and 
what's nice is that it's not going to overwrite, as I said earlier, it's not going to overwrite variables that are already defined in your environment. So if we actually set a variable in our environment, like so, we go export app name equals, um, what is it, uh, you know, cooler app. So, one, we should be able to see that. We could, uh, should just be able to go name, echo app name. Yeah, that should do something. So it's, as you can see, it's defined in our environment. But we should be able to run the app now, or run our application now. And you can see it's hello world from cooler app. So even though the env file contents didn't change, we're actually reading this from the environment itself. And that's neat for, like I said, production purposes because you can include this code for development and then in production, like a Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes uh, hosting, for example, um, if you manage it through Kubernetes or something like that or Docker, you can supply these environment variables whenever you start the container. Um, and again, that allows you to basically segment your development environment from your production environment and they can kind of exist side by side, makes development super easy because you don't have to repopulate these variables and then when you actually want to deploy the production, you just don't even have to really worry about the fact that the .env was used in the first place. Um, and of course, you can also use the .env to provide sane defaults. Um, maybe someone didn't actually give you anything for the env. You can always populate the values you want from .env as well. That's another option. Um, again, I wouldn't put anything secrets, any anything like that in there, but certainly basic configuration could be put in there. Um, like, you know, oh, I want to run on port 8080 or something like that. Um, so. Yeah, I think that really concludes uh, this video here. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, anything else, basically, you know, leave a comment, like and subscribe, all that good stuff. And until next time.